So with an absolutely crazy day in AI, there have been some announcements that you really don't want to miss. So without wasting any more time, let's take a look at some of the most concerning stories in artificial intelligence. So one of the craziest stories that I actually wanted to cover, but I really just didn't have time because there were just so many different stories, was the fact that Sam Altman has been removed slash gives up control of OpenAI's startup fund, resolving unusual corporate venture structure. So essentially, OpenAI CEO Sam Altman has, has transferred formal control of the eponymously firmed name Corporate Venture Fund to Ian Hathaway, OpenAI confirmed to TechCrunch. The OpenAI Startup Fund, launched 2021, was initially set up with Altman's name as the controller, and the arrangement could have actually presented a major issue to the company if he had not been reinstated as OpenAI CEO following his brief ouster in November. So it's like some of this stuff is still here, like it's pretty crazy. I, I mean, I still can't believe that that story was even pretty true. Um, and it basically says here that Hathaway joined OpenAI in 2021 and played a key role in managing the startup fund leading investments in Ambience, Healthcare, Cursor, Harvey and Speak. And uh, Harvey is one of the uh, companies that OpenAI recently did a partnership with where they are essentially looking to do legal stuff. And I mean, it's really cool. I covered it before, but um, I think what it goes to show as well is that OpenAI, their fund is investing in a lot of stuff and the things that they are investing in seem to be actually playing out pretty, pretty well. Um, and yeah, it says last year, the fund had $175 million in commitments and now holds $325 million in gross net asset value, according to an SEC filing and investors included Microsoft and other external backers. And the unit invests in early AI stage driven companies and feels like healthcare, law and education. So um, it's pretty crazy how this startup fund is going to work because I think they're going to do pretty well. And I think it's kind of good for a lot of companies, but we've seen the returns already. I mean, like one of the companies like I spoke about, which was Harvey, um, is pretty crazy. And I can just imagine like all of these companies with exclusive partnerships with OpenAI doing well. So that startup fund, I mean, you know, it, it was pretty crazy title to read at first when it's like Sam Altman removed. Like if you go to Reuters, it says OpenAI removed Sam Altman's ownership of its startup fund. Um, so yeah, this was a pretty different title. You can see how different um, articles kind of report the news, but I, I don't think this is uh, that much of a big deal for Sam Altman because if you didn't know, this guy's uh, pretty much really close to becoming a billionaire. Um, and I would argue that, you know, whatever, you know, of course he doesn't own shares in OpenAI, but the structure is so weird that he doesn't really need to anyways. So um, yeah, I, I think that this news is, you know, not that bad for Sam Altman, but it is uh, still, still a piece of interesting news. Now, something that I wanted to show you guys, and this was actually old news, but it was something that really did get swept under the radar because I didn't see it and I didn't see anyone talk about it and I didn't see any posts. And the crazy thing about this news was that when I searched for this news, I genuinely could not find this anywhere. And the clip I found had like 200 views. So um, this is something that I will leave a link to in the description, but it just goes to show how much news is out there. But let me know what you think about this because uh, I, I think this is actually pretty fascinating and it kind of goes to show how we're going to be moving in terms of like personalized AI agents. Let me introduce you to L'Oréal Paris Beauty Genius, our first virtual personal beauty advisor. Hello, Nicholas. What's up? So I still feel a bit jet lagged and uh, I'm sure it shows. Do you have any advice? Let me see. As a first step, I would recommend Rivitalift Hyaluronic Eye Serum. But I suggest that we do a complete skin diagnostic. I'll need a picture of you to do that. Okay, so your skin's in pretty good shape. Here are your skin concerns based on the results of your skin diagnosis. I'd be happy to help you create a skincare routine tailored to your skin. The Beauty Genius is capable of providing personalized diagnostic of both skin and skin tone, personalized recommendation, and personalized education curated from social media and brand platforms. So yeah, um, like I said, generative AI is going to be built into a different like huge 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 stack of different products and beauty was one of the ones where i wasn't really really figuring out beauty because i'm not someone that is uh i guess you could say plugged into the beauty space i'm more of you know focused on tech and, and other things like that you know uh i guess it just goes to show that there are a variety of industries and you know when we do say that ai is going to impact everything i mean i guess that is really truly a true statement because i wouldn't have you know second guessed that you know beauty companies are starting to invest in these ai apps that are like your personal beauty advisor but i guess from a business standpoint this actually does make sense let's say you're l'oreal you launch a personalized beauty agent you could pretty much recommend 
any product that is yours through the app. And if the app actually becomes really, really popular with influencers, and let's say it's really accurate at determining what skin condition is what, it's going to be really, really good in terms of the conversion rates for the funnel, because it essentially means that now they have an app which can be shared like a social tool, and they can just funnel millions and millions of customers into the products that they want them to buy, provided that they are obviously good. So I think something like this will be kind of fascinating to see how generative AI apps actually change the landscape of e-commerce, because I think it was something that was widely debated before. And I do think that now that we're starting to see this change in these kind of, you know, companies, um, but like I said before, I haven't really heard much about it other than this, other than this demo. So I think as vision systems do get better and as they have more money to invest in vision systems that are specific in terms of, you know, being able to identify certain things, I think things like this will be the norm and not just for, you know, beauty. I think it's going to be for healthcare and I think it's going to be also for fitness as well. So, um, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, this is definitely something that shows us where the future is headed because humans are inherently lazy and you can definitely exploit that to just be like, look, take a picture, do this, do that. Um, and you can definitely have the opportunity there. In more TikTok news, um, this one's actually longer than you think, but I'm going to let you guys see the first clip first, and then I'm going to talk a bit about this because there was actually two pieces of news that you might want to understand. The music industry might actually be cooked. Manager Jake sent me his tweet about a music generating AI called Suno. I told it to write a song about drinking 43 cans of Dr. Pepper a week. It made four. <laughs> The music so this is something that has actually taken the industry by storm and i know that was an old title of mine but suno is a really 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 good platform it's just a shame that it hasn't got more worldwide recognition because the implications of this software are most certainly profound now the reason i wanted to talk about this is because we are on the i wouldn't say precipice but we are someone who is like in the tech industry we're like looking at all the trends we're staying up to date with ai news and this is of course suno the three you can actually make a bunch of different songs you can do quite a lot of things with this app it's actually really really good at making music but the point i was trying to initially talk about was the fact that this kind of software is something that I wouldn't say it is in its infancy, but in terms of the worldwide people using this, I think so far we haven't seen a worldwide application. I mean, I know that content creators like myself um, and people who make content on the internet, we can use this for background music. We can use this for, you know, any short films or, you know, stuff like that. But the point is, is that this, you know, software is going to get really, really good in the future. And I'm truly wondering how good it's going to get because you know when you have music that you know you're able to see um and it sounds really good i mean are we going to get completely ai generated music stations that are you know in a nearby future let's say 10 years from now it could be completely fine-tuned to what you like like maybe you're not going to be listening to music created by an artist because like you i could literally go ahead um, and i can show you guys how quickly and easily it is to create a song um i could literally just put an electronic dubstep song um, and I'm not going to say song about oranges. I'm not going to say that this is, um, this is, uh, you know, something that people are going to be using today. But the point is, is that if I can go ahead and click create song, imagine this is embedded into an AI system that is personalized for me. And I say, look, I'm feeling sad. Um, I just want to listen to a song about, you know, this or that. And the AI system creates music for me about this on that. But the point is that whatever specific subject I want, it's able to create that and it sounds super realistic. I'm not talking about there's mistakes in AI. I'm not saying that it's going to sound a little bit like AI. I'm saying it's 100% indistinguishable. You know how some AI voices you just can't believe it's an AI? I'm saying that in the future we could have that. Um, and is that going to change the generative landscape in terms of what applications are being built and provided to customers? And I definitely think it will be as long as the quality is there because if they can make music that you know I, I input like 10 of my most favorite songs and then it's able to make a song that i just love listening to um i kind of wonder i, I kind of wonder if people are going to be you know like okay this was made by a human i don't want to listen to it or if people are not going to care because it sounds so good so um there are also fully automated music channels and another thing i do want to talk about whilst this is being made so this song is currently being made not sure how long it's going to be but another thing I do want to talk about as well, there was a demo of a music tool. And to me, it sounded 
indistinguishable from reality as in if someone told me they made that i would not have questioned it whatsoever and it's quite incredible because suno v3 wasn't released that long ago and for them to have made another startling jump and it wasn't suno um, I can't say which company it is because right now the company doesn't really want it to be around. There are some leaks floating around on Twitter. I'm not going to post them here because just for the fact that, you know, the company doesn't want it to be out there. They didn't send it to me. I just managed to find it on Twitter. If you find it, you find it. But the point is, is that um, the technology is advancing incredibly rapidly. And that is, uh, I wouldn't say frightening, but it is eye-opening to show you how quickly things move in the generative AI space. And I do think OpenAI is sitting on something like this. So this took us maybe two minutes or whatever. And so the lyrics are here. And I've got to be honest with you guys. That actually sounds pretty good. Like if someone told me that they made this and I paid like $600, $1,000 for this, I'd be happy. Like if I told someone to make me a song and, and they came back with this and I paid them that much, of course I don't pay people that much, but that's that's pretty, like genuinely guys, like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. That is pretty, pretty crazy. And I know independent artists, there's still gonna be musicians that, you know, have festivals and, and that kind of aspect is of course there. But this kind of music uh, where you're not going to need certain things, for example, like I said, content creators won't need individual artists to create film scores, or maybe you will. But I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, maybe you will need, you know, individual scores for very specific things that, you know, you can only look at. Um, and maybe there's not going to be as much compute directed towards these problems. But I think this is uh, just showing us how crazy things have progressed. And like I said before, remember, one thing that I always remember with AI developments is that this is the worst the systems will be. Now, Grok CEO Jonathan Ross says that because generative AI is about creating new things, compute is the new oil. Now, if you don't know who Grok CEO is, I was meant to make a video on his technology, but essentially a uh, former Google employee and he has, uh, well, not just him, of course, his company, um, they've made the fastest pretty much inference for AI um, and it's absolutely incredible. If you haven't used it, I would go ahead and use it because you put in a prompt and it outputs like two pages of text, which is in 0.2 seconds. Not an exaggeration. It's super fast. Um, and it's, it's just absolutely crazy. I'm a little bit tired, but it's pretty crazy. But here he talks about how compute is a new oil. And I'm going to touch upon that in a second. As the new oil. And wow. the, the reason it think, think about it this way. We were in an information age where you would make copies of data with high fidelity and you distribute it. That's what the Internet was. That's what mobile was. But that's also what the printing press was. They're effectively the same type of technology, just at a different scale. And even though it was the same type of technology at a different scale, even that was hard for our intuitions to adapt to. But generative AI is not an information age technology because you're not making copies of something. You're making something new in the moment. And the difference is when you're making something new and in the moment, you need compute to do that. It's not about retrieving something from a hard drive, doing a little bit of compute and sending it out. You are creating it in response to a particular question. And what we often see is people will train a model and then they'll go, mission accomplished, we've succeeded. Now we're gonna put it into production. And then all of a sudden they realize they're gonna to have to spend 10 to 20 X to deploy it. And so you spend your money when you're training the models, you make your money when you're actually doing inference. So yeah, he's got a really good point there because a lot of these models that were released, they spent a lot of time optimizing them. If you remember with GPT-4, it was 25 messages every like six to four hours. Um, if you remember Google's Gemini 1.5 Pro, they talked about how compute was an issue, inference time was an issue. Also, Alpha Code 2, they said they're not going to release it yet because, you know, compute, that they just don't have the compute to run it. If you remember Sora, OpenAI Sora, additionally, they also spoke about how compute is an issue because it's very, very compute intensive. So like they're saying, compute is definitely the new oil. Um, and it, that that is, you know, they need that to be as efficient as possible. And until, you know, I wouldn't say certain breakthroughs are made because breakthroughs are being made, you know, constantly. There's small, you know, five to 10% gains across the board nearly every week in various different categories that just, you know, aggregate across the board to an overall, you know, gradually increasing slope in terms of AI efficiency. I think uh, that we are moving to a stage where, you know, compute is still going to be the major player because that is, you know, what people are lacking right now. And NVIDIA are benefiting from it completely. They are just, you know, backlogged full of billions of dollars worth of orders. Um, and the point is, is that, you know, some of these companies are just, you know, like the, the main thing what these companies do is they like try and figure out the solution first and then they try and optimize it, which is why compute right now 
is of course the new oil because it allows you you know to to basically you know focus on the solution first and then um try and figure out how you're going to optimize it you know so uh yeah i mean i mean it's kind of fascinating how you know the economies and some of these companies uh, are changing in relation to that times or a billion times smarter than you we're baby steps away from super intelligence and when you have intelligence that's a million times or a billion times smarter than you are, you have to figure out what to do. And so people think that Blueprint is about health and wellness or about vegetables, and it's really not. It's what to do on the eve of super intelligence. You know, our intelligence relative to an insect, we're orders of magnitude more intelligent than insects. And we can do things that insects can't do. AI is going to be orders of magnitude more intelligent than we are. It will do things we can't do. And one of those things could be solving aging. We don't know, but it's reasonable to contemplate that that could be a situation. Now, if that's the case and we're this close to these tools being available, then we may shift as a species from caring about wealth accumulation and status and power to simply don't die. And so the observation is that don't die is the most played game by everyone all over the world every day. You and I breathe every few seconds. We look both ways before we cross the street. We all play don't die. So it's played more than capitalism. It's played more than any religion. It's the most played game in the world. If you don't know who that is, that is Brian Johnson, the guy who's trying to basically live forever. He spends over $2 million a year on his personal health care. And he's had some pretty shocking results. He's pretty much got the interior of like an 18 to 35 year old, despite him being like 45. But the point I'm trying to make here is that he's super young on the inside. Although many have, you know, said some remarks about his appearance. I think he looks completely fine. Uh, the point here is that we are on the eve of super intelligence. And that essentially means that we're about to experience a society that if super intelligence is true, if we can somehow manage to pull that off without, you know, destroying our earth in the process, we're going to be in an age of crazy abundance, maybe dystopia. But the point is, is that, you know, aging could be something that is solved relatively quickly, meaning that society's values will change. I mean, a lot of things that we value in society are based on the fact that we die. You know, um, we value certain time with loved ones because we die. We value, you know, our holidays because we're never going to get them again. And we value our youth because it evaluates, it evaporates. So, you know, we're moving into an era where people are right now saying, don't die, don't die, because once super intelligence gets here, it's going to solve aging and you're pretty much going to be able to live forever. So, I mean, what do you guys think about this? This is definitely what I want I want you guys to think about um, in terms of just the societal implications. And if you do want to live forever and if you think solving aging is something that should be done, because whilst death is actually pretty bad, I'm wondering if society isn't going to be able to, uh, I guess you could say, cope with that in terms of the, you know, potentially overpopulation. Maybe super intelligence will probably solve that too. And then, of course, we do have the situation where if certain people don't die, things are going to get super interesting because, you know, how do you get um, oh, health? Certain prison sentences served. The serial killer is going to keep coming back out because, you know, some of them have like 150 year prison sentences. I mean, you know, th there's a billion different questions you could ask for this, but it's definitely something that goes to show that once super intelligence does get here, when deployed, if it is able to solve certain things, society is going to change way more than we think because it only takes two or three breakthroughs for society to completely change. Um, and I think that's something to be aware of. Now, here we have the title of the video is that investors are in talks to help Elon Musk's X AI raise $3 billion, which would actually put his startup at a valuation of $18 billion. Now, I don't have access to the Wall Street Journal. I swear I'm subscribed to at least like 15 different business articles. So I'm not going to subscribe to another one. But the gist of the story is that um, he's in talks with some investors to, you know, raise $3 billion and $18 billion valuations doesn't mean he's getting $18 billion. It means he's getting $3 billion. Now that's good because that means that Elon Musk can fund his war in terms of trying to retain and his his talent because as you know right now previously you know OpenAI and google are trying to poach talent from you know tesla and other companies like meta um and right now ai talent is scarce and very very expensive and the compensation that people are offering is literally above 900k um for senior ai researchers so it's pretty pretty incredible the amount of money that's being thrown at these researchers and you know right now if you're an ai researcher you pretty much have your you know pick of the lot because these companies really do need you in order to stay competitive since it is you know such a rapidly moving space and i think it just goes to show that you know if elon musk does get this funding 
I think XAI is going to become a real competitor in the AI space because Elon Musk is someone that I really just don't bet against in terms of his track record for being able to innovate um, in a very interesting way. But at the same time, I know that this is a very, very fast moving place. So I'm wondering if Elon Musk can catch up and if some of the other places can too. Because one thing with AI is that certain breakthroughs can put other companies you know, really, really far ahead of other ones. And one of the biggest questions that I've had is I've had, imagine if Google just, you know, just patented the transformer and if they just didn't release it, they just didn't open source it. They didn't allow people to know what was going on. They just released the technology um, and everyone was dumbfounded by it. I think, I think that will be interesting to see if, you know, in the future, the AI landscape is like that. I hope it's not because, of course, you know, it would lead to definitely a lot of centralization. But I think it's going to be really fascinating to see how things work with regards to how these companies are investing their money. There was also a clip from AGI House and they basically said that world simulators would lead to AGI because, I mean, it makes sense. It really does make sense. When, when you dive into what they're stating in this interview, it really does make sense. And I'm going to play a clip from the in not Today, not interview from this me. conference. Um, and it's fascinating because they say that, you know, the only way to accurately predict the world with a video engine is to have something that accurately predicts the real world in terms of an AGI level system. So, I mean, it kind of does make sense because they, they'd have to understand how people are walking, how people are talking, how they'd move. Um, and I'm guessing it's going to have to infer some of that stuff and it's going to have to build up that world engine inside. And using that internal world engine, we could definitely get to AGI. So I'm going to include a clip from that. Um, and it's just an interesting perspective on how, you know, things are changing in terms of what we thought would lead to AGI. So, I mean, it's definitely something that, you know, the full clip is 35 minutes. I'm not going to play all of that. It's just 60 seconds. But it is something that I think was rather fascinating too. In some other crazy news, NVIDIA is planning a $200 million AI center. The chip maker is partnering with Indonesian telecom giant Indosat Arido Hutchinson as it expands into Southeast Asia. And this is not surprising at all. NVIDIA's got a huge, huge boatload of profits right now that it can offload to anything that it wants to do. Of course, its main area is going to be research and design for its future you know, chips. But um, planning a $200 million AI center is going to be pretty, pretty fascinating. You know, that's going to accelerate how many chips it produces. And it seems that, you know, things are just continually, continually going to improve. And then we had a short clip from the CEO of Magic Dev. And if you don't know, this is the air company that recently made a breakthrough in terms of software engineering. Um, and they basically have an AI system that's going to be able to code. And yes, if you're a software developer, definitely pay attention to this because it's something that you definitely want to pay attention to. Now, I don't think I'm going to actually have a clip from this because I think it's CNBC and they might copyright this. But the point is, is that, um, you know, he talks about, you know, million and millions and millions of context lengths. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting whenever their product is deployed because they do have some serious competition from Devon and others. But uh, yeah, I, I think his confidence in this interview shows us that they're really, really, really cooking up some very, very fascinating things. 